And here we go. The silly season is on us. And very few people, uh, Kevin Rudden was one who actually looked up or knew what we meant, that it wasn't a derogatory comment, but it was a tribute to people in Milford who not only stand up and say it should be better, but are willing to stand up and make it better. So my hat is off to all candidates who are willing to help our children, help our town, be a little better. Tonight, the man with the most memorable first election ever. <laughs> but why don't we start with an introduction? Uh, thank you, Al. Uh, I don't know where to go from that, but um, John Erickson, uh, Milford resident candidate for selectman this year. And I'll start with my first question, but before that, the first time I'll never forget, 13 votes. I hate to correct you, but 14. 14? But yes. Okay. It was, uh, it was a tough pill to swallow, yeah. I, lo I lost that election by 14 votes. Yeah, but it was your first ever election. Yeah, it was quite the learning experience. You know, it's pretty amazing that the first time out of the shoot, but you also prove to a lot of people where they say, well, my vote really doesn't matter. So out of a town of 28,000, 14 people. Yeah, 14 votes. It was, um, it was a very enlightening experience. It was a very humbling experience. Um, and it was really a gut check experience. Um, you know, after, after losing something like that and putting three or four months into campaigning and, and you know, trying to let people know who you are and what you believe in, um, to lose it, you go through a roller coaster of emotions. I'm not, you know, I'm not embarrassed or shy to, to admit that. And it makes you think, why did I do it? Do I want to do it again? And I went through the next few months saying, yes, no, yes, no. But in, in the end, you have that gut check moment. And it, it's, um, why did you do it? Because you cared. And you think you still have something to offer. And you need to do it better next time and let people know who you are. But the next time, you were the top vote getter of all of them. Yeah, and that, <laughs> you know, that, had, its, that had its rewards as well. Um, and you know, I learned a lot along the way. I learned um, more of the material to, to present to people on what our challenges and problems and obstacles were. Uh, I learned how to, certainly learned a little bit better how to speak in public, um, which is a work in progress. Uh, as you know, my engineering background, we're not the most outgoing people, but uh, certainly analytical and, and thoughtful. Um, and just the entire process on how to campaign, how to let people know who you are. So, first question, always the same, and it'll be the last question. John, I'm from Milford. Why should I vote for you? Well, I think to answer that, Al, it goes back to what I just said, is uh, to vote for me, you have to know who I am. Uh, who I am uh, from a bio perspective, I've born and raised in Milford, uh, went through the Milford public school systems, uh, went to college at WPI, graduated, and then joined my father in in the family business, electrical contracting, Ericsson Electric, which uh, still serves Milford to this day. I worked full-time in that from 1990, um, and I guess full-time until 2011, but along the way I started working part-time for the town of Milford, as you know, as the assistant building inspector, first as the assistant wiring inspector for a year, and then moved on to you know the, the part-time 20-hour week job as the assistant building inspector. Uh, in 2011, uh, Anthony DeLuca retired. He was, you know, he was he he put me in place there. He hired me. All he he recommended me, and, and the board hired me. Tony inspected many of our homes. Yeah, um, Tony, lifelong Milford member, and I have uh, the utmost love and respect for him. He was a great mentor and a, and a great friend. So in 2011, when he retired, um, I was appointed building commissioner as his successor. So I've been full-time now for five and a half, six years, whatever that, that math is. Uh, and with that, between the part-time and the full-time municipal experience, you really get to know town government on a different level. You're in there 40 hours a week, seeing the needs, interacting with all the other department heads, um, and really just getting a, a sense of municipal government that I never expected to have. You know, my interest was always construction, uh, and that's what put me in that, but as, as you're into, you know, that's a full-time job for, for the town of Milford and the, the corporation that it is, it's amazing how much you get to, to learn about the operations. Um, so if we go back three years ago, you know, I, I 
had the interest in the sense that I wanted to contribute outside of a day job, and I ran for school committee. And as we said, my first attempt was unsuccessful, but since then, uh, I came back the next year and was successful. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm proud of that. I was proud to come back, and I'm proud of the immediate impact that I feel I had with the committee. And I gotta stop you, because when you say wasn't successful, you know, I mean, if I run for office, I'll get my six loyal viewers. But you came within 14 votes of one of the most critical seats, first time ever. I don't know that I'd call that, I mean, I guess it was unsuccessful that you didn't get a seat, but pretty strong turnout to come within 14 votes and then become the number one vote getter the next time. Well, I appreciate that, Al, and um, you know, had I been successful the first time, I don't know I'd be where I am today. I may have taken it a little bit for granted. As I said earlier, it was a, it was a gut check moment at one point and a decision on whether or not you're committed and what you have to offer. Um, so, so, you know, being successful in winning the second year, uh, I'm very proud of what I've contributed to that committee and what our committee has done as a whole. Uh, so with that said, I think if you look at my, my life experiences, my professional experiences, um, from a private business owner to a, a town official, public safety officer, and elected official, I think I bring, you know, a combined amount of experience that uh, can really see the concerns of of all the um, representatives in town, from the, the taxpayers to the businessmen to the parents, um, the needs of the school. And I just think I bring a, a combined experience that's, um, you know, pretty unique. So, John, number one vote getter school committee position. Somebody comes back to you now years later and says, what have you done? How would you answer that? What have I done? I think, I think, I don't think I've done anything. I, I, I think I've participated in an awful lot. I think we've had uh, an extremely productive committee, collaborative committee, that has seen more changes in the last two years um, than anyone would have expected. If we start with, you know, groundbreaking, construction, and opening of the new Woodland School, you know, that's, that's a big project in and of itself. And then if we move forward, we've had uh, a change in superintendents. We had to consider whether to you know, go on a nationwide search, so to speak, or to promote from within, and we gave a lot of consideration to that. Uh, and I'm very happy and pleased that we unanimously, unanimously appointed Dr. McIntyre as our superintendent. Along with that, we had drastic IT needs um, as recently as a year ago. You mean our stone tablets weren't enough? <laughs> Correct. Uh, I love that phrase. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we went for forward with the E-rate application. It was approved, and we now have essentially all new infrastructure in place. Network, we improved to a Class A network and servers and, you know, everything that goes with it without wasting too much time on that, not that it's a waste. Um, and then we had, you know, our we had to appoint a new special education director. Uh, along with the appointment of the new superintendent, we had to appoint a new assistant superintendent for curriculum. Uh, we had to appoint, an, you know, we created the position of director of instructional technology uh, in digital learning out of, out of a serious recognition for need, which uh, is the first position of that type in Milford and is, is solving a lot of, a lot of, um, it, solving a lot of problems and creating a lot of great situations with professional development and, and curriculum and, you know, as you know, the Chromebook initiative and, and just so much more. So now, why leave the school committee? Uh, well, honestly, I, I, if successful, I leave the school committee because I saw a bigger need with the, you know, the leadership and the management on the town side of government. What would you bring to the selectman's office? Well, what I would bring is, you know, the combination of experience that I brought before, uh, that I mentioned before, um, the insight f from working in town hall daily, uh, and more than that, the 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 ability and and the recognition to of, for collaboration with other town officials in town. Nobody's getting anything done on their own, regardless of how how good they think their ideas are. 
I think for starters we need to rely on our on our department heads, you know, our, ta our highly professional town officials. Just like at the school, I've, I've always advocated that, you know, with, in a lot of aspects, we need to rely on the administration. We need, but, you know, we'll support them, but they need to be accountable for their results. On the town side, I think we need to rely more on our professionals' opinions. From the financial director, the town engineer, the town administrator, these are the people that are in town government you know, 35 hours a week on paper and 60 to 70 in reality. And I think what I bring is the, the ability to listen, to rely on our professionals for, for many aspects, uh, to hold them accountable for their opinions and decisions, and, and, and to move this community forward, again, together with collaboration from, from all the parties. From my day job, from you know the past 14 years, I work regularly with police and fire, public safety, board of health, planning, engineering, um, the finance department, and the town administrator. That's a part of my daily life, and that's the view that I bring to the board of selectmen. And I think that's um, I think that's a big and key attribute. Now I apologize for using profanity, but I've got to ask the question. Your feelings on Prop Two and a Half override or debt exclusion? Uh, let's take. Well, I think they're both fairly easy stances. Um, I can't ever imagine a, a support in a Prop Two and a Half override unless there were such extenuating circumstances where some sort of catastrophe happened at the state or national level where where our, our state funding dropped dramatically. Not one of the traditional percentages that we've seen in the roller coaster in the last 15 years. So uh, basically I can't imagine supporting a Prop 2.5 override. And similar with the debt exclusion, I, I, can't, I can't envision a need for a debt exclusion. We're so far below the levy limit, the maximum levy limit now. However, if we look long term at some of the projects that may be coming down the road, as you know, we've, we've discussed what's our next project. That on, on the school side, and all indications are pointing towards a renovation of the high school. There's a school coming. There's a school <laughs> coming, uh, and as you know, we're in, you know, we're in much better shape than predicted from the Woodland project. Uh, we expected to use some stabilization funds for there, and we didn't have to. Um, but if we're moving forward on a high-dollar school project. I wouldn't advocate for a debt exclusion, although we may want to consider voting for a debt exclusion with the big, the big piece of that being we don't ever have to exercise it. But you can only vote for a debt exclusion at the beginning of a project, so it's almost insurance in case something goes wrong down the road. And I'm not suggesting that we do that, but I'm suggesting that we, we look at it closer when and if that Isn't time that comes. Isn't that what we built up stabilization for? Absolutely. I mean. We're so the, the, t to be clear, the short answer is I don't anticipate favoring a debt exclusion. I mean, realistically, you know, you think about 12 years ago where we... Um, Sorry about that mess. Oh, no. <laughs> where we started saying there's a school coming. I feel pretty good that we're doing Woodland out of our normal budget. Yeah. As I said, we, we expected to use stabilization. Yeah. So we're, we're far better off than we anticipated two and years ago. And if we start saving now for eight to ten years to do the high school renovation, God willing, we'll be in the same position and we won't have to. I couldn't agree more. Um, immigration, always a hot button. It is. Some people, you know, we always, I always kid around and say there's 28,000 people that know Milford's the center of the universe and six billion need to be educated. But realistically, we're limited on what we can do on immigration policy because we can't deport people to Rhode Island. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you know, immigration starts at the, at the federal level, but what we need to do, in my mind, is manage the effects of immigration. And by far, the biggest effect is at the school system and in, in the ELL numbers. Uh, you've seen in the last two years, they went from if you're rounding off 450 to 550. Th th those, again, as you know, uh, through the Finance Committee, are, are causing some 
uh, undesirable increases in our budget. So I, I think, you know, the biggest effect on that immigration has is the financial aspect and the, Im and the uh, impact on our schools, um, and not only financially, what, you know, what it may be taken away from the traditional student. I mean, realistically, when I think of our graduating class, you know, when I was a kid, I was the first class out of Milford High with 222 graduating seniors. Here we are 40-odd years later, and we're 265. So we've only added one net person each year. So when you throw in 100, you know, that come in in August as a surprise, that really can tip the apple cart. Oh, it definitely, it definitely tips the apple cart. And um, again, more, more than just the sheer volume is the, the number of ELL. And, and the, um, you know, the mandates on ELL is now we have to track former ELL students that we didn't have to do several years ago, causing more of a budget impact. Track former, what does that mean? Track former? You saying we have to track? Oh, we have to, well, once they graduate or, or, or move out of the ELL, their classification is an ELL student, the new classification is former. Oh, so they're still former. in the school system. They're still in the, they're still in the system, but now they're okay. out of the English language program, so now they're F E L former English language learners. They're FELs? They're FELs. What a that's horrible ex name. That's exactly the acronym. <laughs> uh, and I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question No, no, first. but when you said track them, I'm like, wait a minute, you mean like once they leave high school? No, once they leave the ELL program, but are still in the school system. Yes. Okay. Capital projects. Well, before I go there, as a selectman, what do you think we could do to mitigate the issues. I mean, obviously, we increased the budget for ELL for the school, but as a selectman, is there anything the selectman's office can do? As far as the ELL impact? No, as far as, far as, as the immigration, immigration impact. impact um, I, don't, I honestly don't think there's a whole lot that you can do as a selectman. Again, to, to, you want to mitigate the impacts, and there's certain, certainly impacts on uh, the police department and their resources. And you know we want to be cognizant of that, but uh, you know immigration can't deport them to Rhode Island. You can't. So <laughs> I, I, as much it it would be great if I did have an answer. I don't. I don't really have don't much solution that, on that topic. I don't know that anybody has a real clean answer. I mean, we can make sure that anybody working on projects is legally allowed to work. I mean, there's certain little things you can do. Yeah, the, the, there are. Um, but I don't know if it's going to have any big impact. I, I think a lot of the impact is from the regulations that we don't control. You know, and, and some of that's on state level and some of that's on federal. What do you think the biggest capital projects the town's going to face are? Uh, capital projects? I think, well, I, I think there's a number. I think by far the biggest one is the MS4 stormwater sewer permit that we have to comply with. Gulp. <laughs> I mean, the short answer to that is I don't know, actually I don't know if it's a short answer, but a little summary to that is we need to have a notice of intent filed this year. We have two phases that need to be implemented, phase one being five year, phase two being 15 years beyond that, and if you're rounding off, the total expected cost is $45 million. Almost half our total budget. Yeah. And that's, you know, uh, for those that aren't familiar, is the stormwater mandate to remove the phosphorus from the runoff that's running into the Charles River. You know, I'm amazed because I, mean, I admired John Fernandes when he said, wait a minute, why are we trying to catch it at the end? Why not catch it before you use it? And I saw that some of the biggest fertilizer vendors in Massachusetts, like 80% of them are removing the phosphates from their fertilizer. And That's got to help. It, it certainly helps, and you know, phosphates have been a, a topic for a long time. My parents, um, my parents have a lake house, and you know, I, I'm into boating and water skiing and such. And and the phosphates have been a concern around bodies of water for for years, for many years. But you know, this is EPA. These are EPA mandates, and um, unless something changes, and there's there's some discussion that it may change, but going forward, we have to plan for the mandates as they are now. 
Uh, so, I, you know, MS4, mass, uh, you know, municipal stormwater management uh, permit is our is our biggest capital item, um, and either standalone as or as a subsidiary to that is a GIS system. But I, that that's I don't want to get into that at, the, at this <laughs> juncture. But um, you know that's maybe further down on the list. If, if it's probably inclusionary with MS4 as we go forward, but onto that we just talked about a new school or, or improvements to a school. So I think that's the you know the second uh, biggest capital item, um, and then we have you know. Uh, uh, the new rescue truck, which is on the list, I believe. Toy toys. Toy yes. toys. <laughs> toy <laughs> toys until you need them. Then, <laughs> then they're not toys anymore. No. Um, so I, th I think those are uh, the, the three biggest. Um, and honestly, there's more. I just can't think of them. I'm well, rattling no, off about so many different topics. I mean, one of the things that's helped us all along when Chief Tui came to us years ago, I think it was even Tui Rev 1, it wasn't even the current Tui Rev 2, that put the uh, ladder truck on at $1.05 million. And we started tucking money away when we had the excess free cash. And it was, again, I felt pretty good that we salted money away for a number of years. That came up and we were able to buy it out of last year's free cash. Yeah, and, uh, and that's big and that's due to you know some, some very good planning for the better part of two decades with our with our stabilization and our free cash and our and our um, taxpayer relief, and you know, again, a lot of people don't seem to understand. You know, when they say, "How can you end up with two million, three million dollars free cash every year?" First of all, the word "free cash" is kind of an oxymoron. It's free because it came out of my pocket as a taxpayer, in part. You know, but realistically. I don't know that we can budget any closer than 97 percent. No, how could you and, and be at all conservative? You know, when you think about it, if we went to school and you came home with a 97 or a 98, chances are your parents wouldn't thumb their nose and say, that's all. Right, and we, and we can't come in on the, under, on the other side of that and off 3, 000, the, uh, three million the other way. Well, see, that's the, the worry is that if we do budget it at exactly a hundred of what we expect. <clears throat> Middle of the year, you gotta go back and you know, you got places like Tom O'Laughlin. I mean, every year he leaves at least $32 out of the million. <laughs> if you look at him of all people, the last few weeks, you can count the dollars he's spending within the hundreds mm -hmm. to hit the number. But if you had to go back to him and say, look, you're gonna lose five or 10%, he's gotta, 94% of his budget's people. You'd have to lay off a dispatcher and you start to cascade. Yeah. So, I mean, I, your question to you, I think we're doing okay budgeting at 97%. Oh, I, I think we are doing okay. And you have to realize, and I know you realize it, but um, we all have to realize why we're getting that extra free cash, extra, so to speak. Um, there's a few hundred thousand that comes from my department, you know, in, in, as the Department of Inspections building inspector, you know, the uh, finance director has a projection of what we'll take in in permit fees, and for the last five years, we've we've been significantly higher than expected, by a, you know the tune of two to three hundred thousand. Um, obviously, new growth has been on the uprise, excise has been on the uprise, but we're going to get to a point where all of those. Are, are on the downswing. There's not a lot of room left in Milford for new homes. Uh, there's really not. I, you know, obviously with my day job, I talk to contractors on a regular and daily basis, and I have them asking me casually, you know, where are there any lots in Milford? I want to build a house. I, you know, they build, you know, and, and these are typically the ones that are building one to three a year because the the bigger builders have some projects left. Um, and I say, I, I have no idea. There, there's no land right now, if you wanted to build a house, that I could say, go see this real estate agent because they have a lot for they sale. They have five or six lots. That they don't have one. They don't have one. Um, and I don't want to say that absolutely, but I haven't seen one. 
Well, no, but I mean, I'm sure that there's one here or one there somewhere. Well, not in the market. So there's, there's, there's certainly a few lots that exist, but, um, you know, not actively marketed. And that is kind of a nice statement in my mind because it tells you that people do want to live in Milford. Uh, it, it does. I mean, there's a demand. There's a demand in Milford. And, and what I see from this, this dynamic right now is that, the, you know, for, for many years it was more cost effective if you wanted a bigger house to sell your house and move. Well, we're at the point where it's going to be put on an addition, put on a second floor, or knock it down and rebuild. And that's not tomorrow, but that's, that's in the next decade um, from everything that I, from what I see. And I think what that's actually going to do is raise our property value significantly. Is that a good thing? Of course it is. That's not necessarily raising your taxes <laughs> significantly. Well, you know, and that's a deeper question because it's a good thing for those that own. Right. It's, it's not a good thing for those that, that you know, I always worry buy. about the people who built Milford. You know, the people who now are living on 1500 of Social Security. The property value goes up. It always feels good. But if their taxes go up, it's hard for them to, to make it. it. It is hard, and I mean, let's face it, taxes are always going to go up, but we want to control as much as possible the rate at which they rise, and it, which has, again, nothing to do with their property value. Uh, the negative to raising property value, or for the increase in property values, is for somebody that doesn't own and wants to, or somebody, wants that, to come somebody in. that's growing up and moving out and buying their you know, their for first house. We wanted to live in Milford. Yeah, your daughter just bought one a few years ago. I mean, I great, told her great timing for her. Yeah, I told her she's finally a true Milfordian. She's third generation Milford, and she lives within two miles of her mother. <laughs> <laughs> so she is a Milfordian. Uh, but back to the tax issue, you know, the values and the taxes. Um, that's 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 sort of the age old struggle, right? We want to keep the taxes as low as we can for for the for the people that have been here and needed and are on a relatively fixed income but we want to increase the services we want to increase school spending to to improve the community overall and you know that's always a balancing act and you'll never make everybody happy no no guaranteed because any taxes that go up i'm unhappy i know they have to yeah and i think what you're saying is right the key is how do we give how do we provide the services we need without raising taxes more than we have to. It's, again, it's a balancing act, right? We don't want our taxes to go up, but we also don't want to have to put our trash in the back of our car and take it to a right. station and pay, as one is obviously one minor example. But So balancing services with, with um, the taxes. If somebody was to ask you, do you get good value for your tax money in Milford? How would you answer? I think you get the best value for your tax money in Milford than any surrounding community. Why? Uh, if you look, it's it's a it's a comparison of our rates, um, and not necessarily the rate, right? Because the rates related to the oh the, the value. tax rate to me, it, I always get a kick tax. out of. You know, uh, we never raise our tax rate, but your valuation goes up. So your taxes go up. Yeah, all I care about in my mind is the check I'm writing this year. Is it bigger or smaller than last year, and by how much? So again, that's to my point. If you look at the check you're writing this year, based on uh, the the dynamics of your house, X number of square feet, et cetera, and look at that with surrounding communities and what we get for services. Again, trash pickup being one, school, school busing, um, the services as a whole, the senior center, the library, um, the, the parks, the, the recreation, the bike trail, all the things that we enjoy as a community. Uh, I don't see you getting a, a better value in, in in a surrounding town. And I have gotten a kick out of some of the towns where they say, well, our tax rate is about, you know, 4,400 in Milford or is it 48 now, somewhere in that range. We're about the same. But wait a minute. We charge some towns for the designer trash bags. Yep. You know, I mean, my daughter lived in Worcester and it was $3 for every little yellow bag. Felt like a Ziploc bag. It was so dang small. Other um, towns I see charge 400 bucks if you want to put your kid on a bus. To me, those are all taxes. They are, and you know that's something we looked at as a school committee uh, charging. We quickly dismissed it, but we looked at the option of charging for, for school busing. 
and we we felt no that's a service that needs to you know be be included for every resident yeah. you know within the, the well, radius within, but you know you sit there and say wait a minute so what's next yeah, i got a fire john Tui says well i'll roll a truck will that be visa or mastercard <laughs> <laughs> are you going to charge me for police cars yeah again i think we have a great balance of um services that we provide for the tax dollar um water company yes. water company mm -hmm. 63 million gulp um any comments oh plenty of comments um i think and i want to phrase this properly that it's a big endeavor it's a it's a relatively big risk for a relatively small reward if we were if we were to purchase the water company <coughs> <laughs> to do everything right, so to speak, to implement the right operations and management, um, to institute the proper oversight. The, the, the benefit is we have the potential to have as good or better wallet, water quality at slightly reduced rates. Uh, and with that, there's a lot of pitfalls. The, big, the, the immediate pitfall is that once we own it, if we own it, and something goes wrong, we need to replace some infrastructure because of an emergency. A tank breaks at the, the new treatment center or an, an older tower or a section of pipe, we need to come up with the money right away. And we don't have it available. We need to go to town meeting. Whereas if it's privately owned, it breaks, they fix it, and ultimately we pay for it in a, yeah. in a, in a rate hike at some point. But you don't have an immediate impact. On top of that, when you take town government, political motivations, personality conflicts, ego, I question whether we can set it up in the optimum fashion. So I see it as potentially a slight reward with a much higher risk. So you'll be one of the people asking questions when we finally have our forums. I'll be asking a lot of questions. I, I've, I have a lot of questions already, but that material is all confidential. Uh, you're probably, you know, as a finance committee member, uh, much more in tune to some of the answers than I am. Uh, and, I, and I don't even know that. I just know that the financial no, no. team is involved. Legitimately, the board there are areas that, from statute, whatever, they cannot be broadcast. Absolutely. I understand that. I mean, we got a lot of questions. We had a lot of questions. We got a lot done the first time we met with, you know, the selectmen and um, our own barrister, Moody. But he can't willy-nilly open it up. And that hurts because you're sitting there saying, it's $63 million of my money. I'm one of the 28,000 people who's chipping in to buy it. I want to know everything. So, and you can't know everything until you get to a certain point, and that, that's a lot of my frustration. Um, another, another caveat to that is uh, how, how much does it impact our bond rating if we want to go forward? Because we know that if we bond it, it will be paid out of the enterprise fund, but we're still carrying $63 million of debt. Um, some of the other questions that I have are, you know, this $63 million number, exactly how do we get to it? Um, you know, who evaluated it, who arbitrated it or mediated it, and, and is, that a, is that a good number? Should it be less? I don't know. I don't have any information to, to review. Um, what I do know is that I've done a little bit of research. Um, as you know, I went to WPI. One of the new newsletters that came out about four or five years ago was um, highlighting a, a book that a WPI professor had written on the benefits versus drawback of public versus private water companies in Massachusetts. And they, she did a study. Uh, I can't think of her name right now. Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And you know, in the study she did, the consensus was she looked at public, uh, privately owned, privately managed, publicly owned, privately managed, publicly owned, publicly managed. And there was the potential for slightly better compliance and slightly lower rates with publicly owned, publicly managed. But again, that's, that's if we can do everything right. If we trip up anywhere on the way, you know, it may not have been a good decision.
Well, I think a lot of people are using the um, sewer department as kind of a bellwether to say, we run our sewer department and that seems to run. But there are a lot of questions because $63 million is not a trivial amount of money. Exactly. And um, not, not to try and cast too much of a joke on this, I really don't want to compare the water coming into my house with, with the, the sewer going out. The sewer going out. I'll take a screw up on that. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly easier than on the other end. Now, recently, middle school East hit the, the media again. It has. Well, well, middle school East again. That was a big. That was a big um, component of uh, uh, my platform, so to speak, on getting on the school committee. Is what are we going to do with it? It's a big building. Um, it was, you know, as part of the original long-range educational plan, it was, to, you know, it was scheduled to be declared surplus when, when New Woodland was built. But New Woodland was supposed to hit the line in 2008, not 2016. So, you know, the questions I had are what are, what, the former long-range edge plan projected through 2000, 2017, and when I got on the school committee was 2015, so we're almost there. So my question is what are, the, what are today's needs in the public schools? at the high school, um, at all the schools really, and the first consideration is space. You know, we, we, we are at a space premium at the high school. It's, it's been stated a number of times we have eight transient teachers without classrooms. We're using rooms that weren't designed to be classrooms as classrooms. Some are storage rooms, some are, you know, now dual purpose rooms. The cheerleading room has classrooms. But we, we looked really closely at all of the potentials from the school side on what we could do with Middle School East. And we looked at it I don't want to say from what we could do, because we know we could do a lot of things. What, what are our needs? Because we don't want to just find a reason to use it. Right. We want to find a need to solve, a problem to solve. Uh, and I worked along with the rest of the committee with all of the school administration and uh, in large part with the principal at the high school, Carrie Banach. Uh, and some of the ideas that were out there were expanding program to middle school east. Well, that was highly undesirable because kids don't want to leave the high school campus. Uh, it's a logistics problem to transport them there. It's added staff more so than if everything was under one roof. And it's just the fact that the kids don't get the same experience by, sure. le by leaving. Um, and again, I said earlier, I rely on the, the experts on something like this. I'm not one to say, no, this is great, do it, we can do it. So you have insight. We never heard moving kids. I always thought they'd throw central office out, Lenny Morcone out. Well, we're getting there. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> we're getting there. Um, so we looked at creating an alternate high school, and, and that has a lot of the same problems that, that you know, additional programming has. We looked at should we lease it out to some of the other programs that have interest in renting space. And, you know, we decided not to, that, not to do that because we didn't see a future um, use within Milford Public Schools, so why be landlords? That would be fine if we had, a, you know, uh, a plan for some use in three to five years, and we could, you know, cover our operating costs with it. But to just, you know, be landlords and even pu who would rent it? Oh, the the Bico pro program had interest. Um, there was another program I, that's escaping me right now, right now that had interest, and that was without formally marketing it. So we really don't know. Um, we also don't know what they would have been paying, what they would have been willing to pay, how much space they wanted. But we didn't pursue it because it didn't seem to fit. Uh, as part of a solution. Uh, we talked about moving central office, family resource center, uh, facilities, community use, special education, administration to that space, but uh, ultimately we haven't decided what, what we're going to do, if anything, to the high school. We, we would need to put some money in it to renovate it, even to make it suitable sure. to move, you know, to move those offices. Um, it's also been talked about some town use. Um, I could still see a use there, probably not in its current incarnation, as sort of a combination town hall annex, school, school administration. You know, uh, there's been, in my mind, a lot of disconnect between the town side of government and the, and the school system. Um, both in operations, you know, from the communications within the finance departments and in school administration, but also from a more, um, 
I don't know, holistic perspective. There's been, there's been, there hasn't been good collaboration between the school board and the board of selectmen. There's been invitations um, by the school board to have a joint meeting, which were, uh, you know, not accepted or declined. And I think, you know, using that school or portion of that school of that build or that building. And this is an abstract possibility. I'm not going to say we're going to do this tomorrow, and I think I would advocate to do it tomorrow. But to make that sort of a combination town hall, annex, school administration facility is a possibility. Whether it's knock down the newer addition, focus on the original school, which is, I think, 30,000 square feet off the top of my head, you know, create more parking, that's a possibility. But to get deeper into it, if that's, you know, that's just one possibility, I think we need to put a committee together to, to examine all the and possibilities. You know, it amazes me because when you think about how many selectmen started off in the school committee, the fact that we don't have closer ties between selectmen and school committee amazes me. Me as well. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something I, I think I would bring to that, to that board because it, it's about collaboration, uh, certainly between, you know, probably the two big, most uh, recognized boards, selectmen in school, but between all of the boards, I think we need more collaboration with school and finance, with selectmen and finance, and, and you know, we're all one community. We, 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 we can't look at any one part in a silo. The schools need this. Well, the schools need this if the town can afford that. And, and we, we've had many conversations about that, but you know, that's, well, the, pers that's the perspective the, that I brought. John, this is the time of year. We started it a couple of weeks ago where we go into a room and finance committee cries, we're broke, we're destitute, we have no money. School committee says if we don't get this much, we can't fulfill our mission. But at the end of the day, by the time town meeting rolls around, we've looked at what is feasible and we all seem to come together. Yeah, and I, I mean, we do, and we do a good job at it, but I think, uh, you know, maybe a modified approach would be more productive. You know, but again, I... I uh, I would love to uh, not have those first meetings. <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is a sort of a culture that's being created in the dynamic, you know, for decades. So I, I think we do have a lot of collaboration and productivity between the boards. Now, you, you're in a kind of a unique position because you've said you came, and I've been very good because every time you said WPI, coming from Holy Cross, I'm so tempted to go, whoopee! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Too many years of automatically saying, whoopee! <laughs> well, you're, you're showing your age there, Al. <laughs> um, yeah, back then they didn't have biotech. I mean, it was amazing what WPI has grown into. Yeah, it is. It was a good school before, but now, outstanding. Yeah, it but, is. But, but that aside. you've gone from there to a family business, now, wait a minute, now you inspect the family business. How does that work? Well, no, I don't inspect the family business because the family business is electrical. Oh, okay. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm building inspection. Building has always been a part of my life. Um, my namesake, my father's uncle, Jack Erickson, um, was a pretty renowned builder back in, the, in, back in probably the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. 60s was probably the tail end of his career. I grew up in his workshop making, making furniture. I grew up with my father not only on construction sites, but doing everything at, at my own house. Um, interestingly, my, my first goal was to go to school for architecture. Uh, the only architecture programs around at the time, the only first rate ones, were uh, Syracuse and MIT. I wasn't going to upstate New York, and um, as proud as I am of my, you know, my accomplishments, I wasn't getting into <laughs> my, MIT. I didn't apply, but I didn't have the, the delusion that I would get accepted. Um, so with electrical in my background, I you know, went to WPI um, and when they ask you, this is going back a long way, what do you want to major in? It was electrical engineering and then physics and then math. I mean, I love math. Uh, I don't know what I would have done with a math degree. Um, Teach. <laughs> well, <laughs> teaching wasn't what I wanted to do. <laughs> I just loved math. So, uh, you know, I went for electrical. And then, you know, part of it was due to, due to the circumstances of the time. It was 1990, you know, the, one of the worst economic times in recent history and I just you know I was I was seriously just helping dad and then I really really liked it and I really enjoyed it and and that got me into the building ends of end of of issues and, and building you know people think framing houses building is so much more complex than that building is sprinkler systems fire alarm systems 
things that engineering come into play with, things that electrical comes into play with. Well, I mean, I remember a couple of years ago you came out and helped the family when you looked at something as mundane as a deck. Mm -hmm. And we had no idea, but you as building inspector could point out, wait a minute, before you buy this, you better look for that, for that, for that. And for, you know, a young couple on their first house, that's critical. It is critical. And, you know, part of the problem with buying a house that somebody's improved is you don't know what, you know, how well the improvements were made because the proliferation of, of HGTV and all of these Saturday morning shows, everybody's an expert now. So, you know, I think we find more things being done improperly now than 30 years well, ago. Well, and again, you know, I can only go back to our own experience. We turned on the switch and the lights came on. You almost make the assumption that all the electricals are flowing correctly. <laughs> And you went up and said, uh, excuse me, no, no, no. That was really important because I don't know, I'm a chemist. I'd have no clue in the world whether or not those wires are strung properly or could be a potential hazard. No, and it's one of the biggest moments of, of, of your life, buying your first house. You know, of course, it's materialistic, but it's also financial and it's emotional. So it's... Um, well, that makes more sense because I've always wanted to ask you, what Thanksgiving at the Erickson house was like if you ever inspected the family business and said, no. <laughs> no, no, we, <laughs> we can't do that. And of, of course, there's, you know, there's really a state ethics in the conflict of interest well, law that, that prevents that. So um, uh, on the rare occasion that I do do work, in t my company does work in the town, I certainly can't permit or inspect it. Um, so, you know, the wiring inspector does, the, tr the full-time wiring inspector does. Uh, and there's other conflicts that, you know, you have to recognize and you just can't participate. Well, it's like my daughter works for the school department, so there's certain things I can't vote on when I'm on the finance committee because technically they affect her. Yeah, absolutely. And we've had, we have members of the school committee that, that have family in the school system and they can't, vote, they can't participate in the contract negotiations. Exactly. Uh, we have other, you know, we have members of the board of selectmen that, that have to recuse for one reason or another. We have members of every board. You just, you have to know, you really have to know what you are allowed to do. But it, there's nothing selectman-wise that would conflict with family business or anything else you're involved with. There, there are, there are certain, there are a few things that I couldn't participate in as so a, so you'd have to recuse as a yourself. selectman that I have to recuse. Uh, anything involving me financially, which would be my compensation which doesn't really go through the Board of Selectmen. Oh, that's right, because you work for the town. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking, what, that massive stipend they get <laughs> Selectmen? No, well, no that's, that's your a, day job. Well, and that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a point that uh, if I were to become Selectmen, uh, that's a stipend I can't accept. I can only accept one salary from the town. Um, so that would be the choice of my $80,000 Building Commissioner's salary or my $8,000 option for selectman salary. And, you uh, can't tell them to take the 8000 and donate it to special needs or something? Uh, no, you can't. You have to, you know, and that, that would just drop down to the general fund and, the, and the, the town can decide what to do with that based on finance committee recommendation. <laughs> yeah, there you um, go. Now, structure-wise, we've obviously in the last few years changed the organizational chart in our town. And I guess I was going, when I started, when I got sidetracked thinking about your family Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you see any changes we should be making in town government from a strategic point of view? Um, I think we're set up pretty well right now, and, and there probably are some changes we need to make. Uh, the, on the positive side, I think we pretty much have um, the finance department set up uh, ideally. You know, with the creation of the finance director, taking the treasurer position, moving it from elected to appointed, adding the benefits director, uh, has, has really put us in a spot where they can all focus on what they need to focus on. They were stretched too thin before. They had they had some functions that were maybe being done by somebody that wasn't necessarily the, the real scope of that, that job, but needed to be done. Adding that one body, you know, uh, decreases the workload, so to speak, or lets you accomplish more. No, lets uh, you focus on. Lets you focus on the areas that you, that you should be focusing on. 
So I think that's been a, I think that's been a big positive. Um, being on town hall side, I see some negatives and potential negatives. Um, and I know you and I may disagree on this, and I know we haven't discussed it yet. Uh, I think we created an IT department a little prematurely. Being there, uh, I see what the role of a consultant could have been and, and how it could have fit all of our needs. And I think that department, the creation of that department, kind of raises the tax base unnecessarily. Uh, especially when we look at it that it's it's town IT but it's not the complete town government side you know we know that the, you know the IT department in town hall doesn't take care of public safety but that's only till we prove ourselves right it may be so as I said premature yeah. well, I mean um, Tom, I, Tom O'Laughlin came to us when we said okay we got a separate contract at the library we got a separate contract here we got a separate contract of police we said we want to consolidate them and he said, guys, you can't do that to me till I really see and feel safe that the IT department can take care of us. So I, I absolutely agreed with him, saying, give us two, three years. Let's see how it works. But all the others, I think, were starting to feel comfortable enough that it's all coming together. Uh, I don't have, I'm not at that comfort level yet, so, you know, I'll, I'll, good. I'll, I'll stay with... No, but with John, it, it, it's good if you're not that you're bringing it up, Yeah. because we don't want to be complacent. No, we don't, and I think, um, you know, I think that we, we tried a model that just wasn't working for a number of reasons with a joint school and IT, school and townside IT department, and I think that could have been successful and could be successful at some point in the future, similar to what you're talking about now, but I think... It's, it's it, the separation has enabled the school system to flourish to an extent. I think, again, that system could have worked. It works in other towns. It just wasn't working here for, for a number of reasons that I, we definitely don't, I, I don't want to get into tonight. Um, but I think, I think that department, in my mind, that's not the route I would have went at that time. Um, we have a proposal to develop an HR position. Uh, from what I see, it doesn't, there's no glaring needs for an HR. There's not any, you know, borderline slight needs for an HR person at this time. Um, you know, and a lot of comparisons are made to private industry, but there's a clear difference between town government and private industry. There's some similarities that we need to compare, and there's some, there's some drastic differences. Um, back to the change in structure, one of them was to, you know, include the IT department under the finance director. And I understand that that's successful in private industry, uh, to me, I don't think it was necessary here. I don't think it was beneficial here. I think our finance director has his hands full. I think he's managing to deal with the IT department now, but I think it should have remained under the town administrator. Could always be moved back, too. Could be. Could be. I think at that point, Rick had said he had his hands full also, so it didn't seem to fit well under him, so it's like, Zach, take it. But uh, I, don't, I don't think that was the case, so, and that certainly wasn't my observation. I mean, we all have our hands full. There's, there's no doubt that everybody, despite maybe some public opinion, um, how hard everybody in that town hall works. But I, I just think it would have been the right thing to, to, to keep that under. And again, nothing is ever cast in stone. No, and this is certainly something we can go forward and, and reevaluate. Because you turn around and say, if it turns out it's better off, uh, giving Zach extra time in this area and moving it to another, like to Rick, I don't know that there's any fundamental change that would be needed. No, that's not a fundamental change. I mean, there's still the question of, is that department necessary? Will it succeed town-wide going forward? Um, but, the, you know, that's, a, that's a, again, a topic that can be addressed in the future. And, you know, that's, that's part of successful management implementation, right? Looking at something that didn't work, and, um, and making yeah, and it work. part of it, I mean, it was a conscious decision not to bring network management in because you couldn't justify Agree. hiring a network specialist. So, you know, luckily we've got people like Lonnie, you know, Worldband that still chip in and help out. Yep. So I don't, I don't know that we'll ever be free of consultants. No, I don't think you will, and I don't think the school would ever be free of consultants because, like you said, there's not enough full-time workload to justify it. Yeah, and there's specialties like network consulting, cybersecurity, 
I mean, there's people that dedicate, it's like saying the hospital, having one surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, you may be a surgeon, but you're not specializing in pediatrics versus brain surgery versus cardiac. You know, there's specialists. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's if one model worked, then we'd all be doing entirely. it. Entirely, that's what everyone would be doing. So we're down to the question I always ask at the end. John, I'm from Milford. Why should I vote for you? Well, I, I hope I've demonstrated in the last hour um, why you should vote for me. But again, I just highlight my commitment to the town of Milford, um, the fact that I'm familiar with the problems, the issues, uh, the needs and concerns of all the varying parties, the businesses, the residents, uh, the school system, you know, the, the parents of school children and, the, and, you know, the empty nesters that don't see the value, in the, not the value, but um, don't want to spend any more than they have to in taxes. Um, again, and that I can collaborate with all the parties involved and make, you know, sound and rational decisions that are in the best interest of, of, of the majority in the whole. And at the end, you still have kids in the Milford school system. In the end, I do. Two, uh, well, actually, we're down to one, my stepchild, uh, Ben, that's uh, 14 now and going into high school next year. Well, that's going to be a challenge. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, to me, there's no better test of do you believe, you know, do you practice what you preach, is if you put your own children into the system that you're helping to fix. Oh, I agree. Um, and, you know, I believe in the Milford school system. My wife believes in the Milford school system. She's a realtor here in town. And, um, you know, she gets asked it quite oftenly. Uh, or quite often and you know as a realtor she can't give a, a absolute opinion but she can say all I can tell you is my my kids are in the Milford school system now her son is but her kids went through it you can't ask for more than that thank you for all you've done on the school committee and for stepping up to help in other areas my pleasure thank you for having me tonight Al and as always I've always said I'll never ask you to vote for any specific candidate but I'll beg you Get to know all the candidates. Pick the person who you best feel represents your values, the values that you want for Milford. And then, please, I implore you, April 4th, get out and vote. So to our six loyal viewers, may God bless. May tomorrow be a better day than today. Good night, all. I've been home Been running all my life just